stage, who will then introduce others. Um, I'm introducing Margaret Baldwin, who is a faculty member at Kennesaw State University. And she's been a playwright for over 25 years. She um, teaches theater and performance studies. And um, she produced a play that has won um, the Jean Gabriel Playwright Award in 2010. And it won my heart um, a little while ago when on a Saturday night in Richmond, Virginia, where I live, my wife and I decided we needed something to do. We wanted to go to a play and we found this play about Selma. We thought, well, that would be interesting. So we go to this play about Selma and we're sitting, we got very good seats. We were sitting almost in the front row and all of a sudden a Unitarian minister walks out on stage. <laughs> and I went, whoa, this is a little closer than just Selma. <laughs> and then um, a little bit later, the Unitarian minister starts talking about their district supervisor being the one that sent them there. And at that time I was serving as district executive in the Southeast and I thought, wow, this is even closer to home. So, so it, was, it was one of those um, theater experiences in which I became very involved. <laughs> And, and um, so I'm, I'm really, really pleased to invite Margaret to our stage today, um, and she's going to introduce uh, the people who are with her or who are going to present a portion of that play today and then have a discussion about it. And she'll tell you more about the play and its genesis. So Margaret, please. I, uh, so this is a play that I wrote, the play is called Night Wounds, and it's a play essentially inspired by a family story. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, I grew up there, my mother was from Selma, Alabama, and I spent uh, much of my childhood there in Selma on all holidays, summers, spring break, at my grandmother's house, and I was very influenced by uh, the relationship uh, between my grandmother and the woman that worked for her, uh, named Matilda Martin. Um, she began working for my grandmother when she was 19, and uh, she, as a housekeeper, uh, she ended up becoming a nurse, putting all of her kids through um, school, and, uh, and uh, nursing my grandmother through the end of her life. Uh, and so I was very touched by their relationship, by the care that they had for one another, and also just by the complexities of that relationship, um, as any, um, all relationships are complex, but uh, when you add um, the, the time and place in which they were living, um, their relationship was really complex to me. And I'd always heard growing up the story about um, the time of the marches, so you know, going to Selma for Christmas, I, we would cross over the Edmund Pettus Bridge and I just knew that they had the great Christmas decorations. Um, I never really knew what it was about. And then I learned that Selma has this place of um, uh, infamy in, in history and, what, um, and that the Selma that I knew was very different from that Selma. Um, but I always heard growing up the story that on the day of the big march uh, that Matilda came to work and she said, um, and my grandmother said, do you know what's going on downtown? And she said, yes. And um, my grandmother said, well, do you want to go watch it? Uh, and the two of them got into my grandmother's Lincoln Continental with my little suicide doors. And uh, my grandmother had to sit in the front. She's about that tall. Uh, and Matilda had to sit in the back. And the two of them drove down to Lauderdale Street and parked and watched the march go by. And I thought, OK, this is a story that needs to be told. Um, but I certainly wasn't brave enough to tell it for most of my life. And uh, then I was working in Atlanta with a theater company, Horizon Theater, and this was about 2006, and Lisa Adler, the producing artistic director there, said, well, what do you want to write next? And I said, well, I think it's time to write this story. So I wrote about 20 pages and got a group of actors together, and we did a short reading, uh, and it became very clear, okay, I need to get uh, until this side of that story, I need to hear that side um, because I never heard it. So I went to Selma um, and, and met up with Matilda, who was still living at that time. My grandmother had passed away, 
uh, long before. And I sat down in my the, the living room of my aunt and uncle and I said, okay, so this is how I've always heard the story, um, but I don't know your sign, what was it like for you? And she said, well, that never happened. <laughs> and I went, oh, <laughs> okay. So the story that had been such an important part of my life and my identity growing up, that really a story that made me want to become a writer, um, and a story that said, okay, well we were, yes, my family was in Selma, but we were the good white people. Um, and, and it was very much a part of my identity, and, and that is the wonderful thing about playwriting and about theater, is that it makes you ask questions. And so what uh, became, I thought, oh, I don't have a story anymore. Driving back to Atlanta and I was crushed, uh, my husband said, well, maybe that's the story. And what, it, what, it, what I embarked upon then became uh, really a journey of discovery. It took me about four years to write. Um, and I went back to my aunt and uncle and told them I was working on this play. And my aunt said, oh, well, let me give you my file. And, I, um, and she gave me a file about this thick of all of her correspondence during that time. And what began to emerge was the story that I felt like hadn't really been told, which is the story of people living in Selma during that time who um, were sort of in the middle. And they were caught in the middle of this time of historic change that was really monumental. And yet, they're just trying to live their lives. And so, uh, so I ended up asking a lot of questions, spending a lot of more time there, interviewing many people, uh, including Matilda, including family members, uh, including my aunt and uncle. My uncle was a, a pediatrician during that time and was um, uh, the first doctor in that area to integrate his waiting room. Uh, and, and it became a story of how families, uh, and families are complex systems, in themselves, but how families uh, begin to um, live through change. Uh, and there is this really wonderful element that came about with this, which is in that correspondence that I found uh, in the file that my aunt shared with me, uh, there was a correspondence with a friend of hers who was a Unitarian minister who had come to March in the March. And he had responded to a letter that she had written and he wrote back and said, I was there. And then she wrote back to him and she said, how dare you come to Selma and not contact me? And it became this whole conversation about, you know, you were putting me on the side of, of the Jim Clarks and you didn't ask. And so um, this exchange then led me to create a character who was a brother, a uh, character who had come back to March in the March unbe unbeknownst to the family and that the only person that knows he's there as part of the family unit is, um, is the housekeeper uh, uh, who I've named Geneva. And, uh, and as, uh, as plays often, you have to create a situation in which all hell breaks loose. Uh, and so, um, and as a playwright, your job is to put your, uh, your characters into a place where the, you are staging choices, where they have to make choices in a pressure cooker situation. And so uh, we're gonna share a few scenes from this play. Uh, the first couple of scenes are from the end, toward the end of the first act. So there's another little family story detail that I should share, uh, which is um, uh, that the occasion for the play happens to be um, the night of um, what the grandmother, because uh, this is an intergenerational play, um, it's the, the night in which um, her night blooming cirrus is going to bloom. And for those of you that don't know what a night blooming cirrus is, it's this really alien looking plant that blooms one night a year and then it's gone. Uh, and my great grandmother had one of those plants and she would have blooming parties uh, and people would sit around and get drunk and watch the plant bloom. <laughs> So, uh, so to set up uh, to set up this story in Selma, um, I have the, the sort of coinciding events, the more family internal event, which is the blooming party, and Lucille wants to go on and make that happen because of um, how it reminds her of her mother. Um, at the same time, we have a dying father, and then we have the outside march, which then intervenes when Clayton comes home. 
Uh, and so, uh, of course, because, um, uh, because this is the, the way of the time, uh, the grandmother, Lucille, uh, asks uh, her housekeeper, Geneva, to come help with the party, um, to just get it set up, but things go awry, and they end up getting stuck there. So the whole family stuck there. Um, she's stuck there while her son is out marching with her daughter. The daughter and the granddaughter get in trouble uh, and they play upstairs. Um, they play dress up together upstairs and that is a no-no. Um, so all of this is happening. We're taking um, the first couple of scenes right from Clayton's entrance. He enters just after um, a big ruckus has happened and then uh, he realizes Geneva is here as well, and there's an interaction with them. Then we're gonna break. I'll give you the setup for the second scene, which happens a little bit later in the play. So, uh, but before I do, I wanna welcome my two colleagues to the stage, Ardale Shepherd and Matt Lewis, both from Atlanta and from Tennessee. Uh, Ardale is playing uh, Geneva, and Matt is playing Clayton. I am playing Ruth. And we are brother and sister, and uh, this is, it's been about two years since we've seen him um, put, uh, set foot in the house or in Selma. So. Good to see you, Ruth. Where the hell have you been? Ruth, listen. Mama has been calling you for a week straight, morning, noon, and night. I know she has. And now you just show up here, out of the blue, without so much as a word? I'm here now, okay? What do you want me to do? Kneel down and wash your feet with my tears? No, I don't. I want what you to listen. What will kill the fatted calf, the prodigal self returns? Are you finished? I'm just getting started. <laughs> I know I should have called first, but I, I had things going on. We've all had things going on. I've been away. Church business. I know all about your church business. Do you? I can hardly get to choir practice thanks to your Unitarian friends out there praying on the sidewalk. <laughs> I'm sure they don't intend to inconvenience you and your choir. They intend to make us look like redneck fools. They intend to stand up for their fellow man. Ruth, look, I, I need to tell you something. What do you need to tell me? How back assward we are down here in Selma? How much we need to change our ways and finally see the light? Frankly, I don't want to hear it, brother. I've heard quite enough. Have you no concern for their plight? Oh, plight. The plight of the Negroes. What about the plight of our family, Clay? Where's your concern for that? Ruth, I, look, I know I've been out of touch. Out of touch? Out of touch? You left me, Clay. You left me here to deal with this mess. You haven't stepped foot in this house, haven't been to Selma for Christ's sakes in two years. I know. Two years of watching Daddy rot away, watching Mother hovering around him like some deranged hummingbird. I know, Ruth, I know. No, you don't know. Miss Ruth. Oh, Geneva, thank you. How's Daddy doing? He's resting. Clay, you remember Geneva? Of course I do. Reverend, it's been some time. It has. I'll take the dress to the cleaners in the morning along with Mr. Stafford's no, robe. Geneva, I'll pay the cleaning. You don't have to. They should have it back by midweek. If you insist. Yes, ma'am. If you'll excuse me. What's that all about? Don't get me started. What exactly happened? The girls were playing together and they got in trouble. What kind of trouble? It doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter. It was Lucy's fault. She shouldn't have been playing with Raynell that way in the first place. What do you mean that way? What, were, what, what is that way? They were playing dress up together upstairs. So? In this house? Oh, Clayton, come. What is so wrong with two girls playing I, together? I'm not going into this. This is exactly what is wrong with this family. Don't go getting on your high horse with me. This is what's wrong with Selma. You're all living in some lily pad world when underneath it, it's a stinking swamp. Is that why you came? To waltz down with your high ideals and cast aspersions on us lowly sinners? No, it's not. Then why did you come? Why do you think I came? Oh, great. You did. Ruth, I had to. Are you insane? What are you thinking? Dr. Parrish asked me personally to come represent our parish. Since when have you 
ever done anything because somebody asked you to? What was I, sp <laughs> what was I supposed to say? He's the regional head of UUA. Daddy is going to go through the roof. I don't care what Daddy and does. Mama? This is, that has nothing to do with them. This is about me. It's always about you. This is what I do, Ruth. This is who I am. I, I've tried to stay out of some. I, I've tried to keep things separate. But when I got the call to come for the funeral, I, I knew I had to. Funeral? For Jim Reed, the white minister who died. I know who he is. Was. You, you mean you've been here since Monday and you didn't call? I tried to. What, was the line busy? You couldn't try again? There aren't so many telephones on that side of town. And where have you been staying? With a family over in Carver Homes. So you prefer the projects now to your own family. I didn't know, Ruth. I didn't know what you were going to say. Because you didn't bother to ask. What was I supposed to say? Hey, Daddy, I'm going to go marching with the Negroes. You want to come? I'm not talking about Daddy. I'm talking about me. In case you haven't noticed, Clay, I have my own family, my own mind, my own thoughts. I know that, Ruth. Then how can you come here and not even call me? I, I didn't want to embarrass you. Please. Or cause you any harm. That is utterly ridiculous. We were told it's not safe to contact the white community. And you bought that sack of lies. Uh, they're not lies. I'm telling you, it's the truth. I know what's the truth. I've been here. I didn't come here to hurt you, or Mama, or Daddy. You came here to shove it in our faces. I came because I was called to help. And how are you helping? By sleeping in their homes? Eating in their restaurants? Going to their night spots? Entwining arms with Negroes of the opposite sex? All you are doing is making a hero out of that no-count Sheriff Clark and his posse men. You want to help? You go down and help Lynn with that Head Start program that's been, been dumped in his lap. Oh, but that's not so glamorous, is it? That's not so dramatic on the television screen. What about Jim Reed? Was he being dramatic? Getting bludgeoned to death? Was that just something he was putting on for the television screen? Of course not. I knew him, Ruth. He was a friend from seminary. I knew him. He was a good man. I'm sure he was. When I heard about his death, all I could think was, I should have been there. Nobody should have been there. I'm sorry for your friend, truly I am, but what was he thinking? Going to Walker's Cafe at that time of night? Are you saying it was his fault? I'm saying that the leaders of your peaceful movement had no business sending those ministers there in the, to that part of town in the dark of night. No man in his right mind. You mean no white man. There are other men, Ruth. I know that, and I agree. They should have the right to vote. But these peaceful demonstrations are simply geared to bring out the most violent... It's starting to sound like a pamphlet from the Citizens' Council. All you are doing is stirring up hate and fear on both sides. You outsiders come in here thinking you can just change... Let me people. remind you I was born here. Then you should know better. Is there something I can get you? Geneva, please. What are you doing here? I thought you were out on the road with the others. What about you? You're going to miss your ride to meet Cleo. We missed it already. I'm not letting this happen. Not for some stupid party. I appreciate you trying, Mr. Clayton. Please don't call me that. But this doesn't concern you. This is my family. They're doing this to you. Then you let me tend to mine and you tend to them. I can take you to Cleo. We can be there in 20 minutes. And get pulled over on the highway by one of Sheriff Clark's posse men. Don't you want to see Cleo to be there to celebrate the night? What do you think? Is everything all right? I was just fixing Mr. Clayton a plate of food. Can I get you anything? It's OK, Geneva. She knows why I'm here. You knew? Yes, ma'am. Look, we have to get Geneva out to the highway. To the highway? Are you crazy? Cleo's marching. Oh, dear Lord. I'm taking them. I'm taking them now. And just how do you propose to get there? I'll take Daddy's car. What if he finds out? I mean, he won't even know it's gone. This is the highway, Clayton. In case you have forgotten, we're talking Lowndes County, KKK, and God knows what They got else. the National Guard out there protecting them. The same folks that would be shooting them if they weren't in uniform. Oh, Geneva, look. You have to be there. Wait for Lynn. He'll take y'all home. We'll wait for Dr. Lindley. 
You're not going? Not with Raynell. I'm leaving and I'm going to meet them on the highway with or without you. Daddy's dying, Clay. He's dying. You can't do this to him. I can't stay here and not tell them what I'm doing. Just tonight. That's all I'm asking. I have to go. You have to stay here. You can't just turn around and leave. You just got here to I, tear them up. I, I can't do this, Ruth. Tomorrow you can walk out that door and never foot, step foot in this household again. But tonight, just be here. Is that so hard? Yeah. All right, scene two. Now we're uh, moving, we're gonna jump. <laughs> so, as you can see, as you can see, the plot is thickening. And uh, of course they all get stuck. Um, and, uh, and Lucy, the granddaughter, uh, the white granddaughter, my daughter in the play, um, uh, she convinces the grandmother to include uh, Raynell and Geneva and to invite them out to watch the bloom as well. So the whole family's out there except for the grandfather um, who doesn't know that Clayton is still there. Um, the grandfather comes in, um, uh, fireworks go off, and Clay, in that moment, reveals to the family that uh, Cleo, Geneva's son, is marching. Um, and this is a big, this is a big deal um, in, in terms of the danger that it puts uh, Geneva in and her situation uh, with the family. So we're going to pick up just after uh, the big blow up scene. Uh, as Clayton has gone out into the night, uh, Geneva follows him and then uh, we'll skip after their exchange, we'll skip a little bit farther to near the end of the play where Ruth and Clayton have one more short scene together. Um, and what, what um, in, in selecting these plays, uh, these parts of the play because of who you all are, I thought it would be really helpful to get a sense of Clayton's arc uh, as someone who is so convinced that he's doing right and has to come and, and, and confront the reality of how difficult that can be um, in, in the midst of things. So, um, so two more scenes and then we'll uh, gather around and get Dick Leonard up here and um, have a talk. Reverend, Clayton, please, you don't wanna go down that road, it'll tear you up. I don't have a choice. You always have a choice. I know, I've been there. How can you stay here? How can you stay here and serve them? You can leave. You can get on that airplane. I have to show up here to work tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. You can do more than this. You are a gifted, intelligent woman. You could, you could go to school. You could get a different job. You can do so many things instead of just standing by. Standing by? Making cheese straws. Look, there, there are men, friends of mine, dying in the streets for you. Doesn't that mean something? Let me tell you something. My son will be starting Selma University in the fall. He'll be the first child in our family to go to college. Now who do you think is putting my son through college, Reverend? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to suggest And right now, she wants to be a doctor. And she's gonna do it too. Doc Lindley says if she can stay right with school, she has a good chance of making something of herself. And who do you think is gonna put her there? You are, of course you are. Who do you think's been feeding the marchers? Who's been sleeping on the floor so you and those white ministers could have a bed to sleep on? Who's been washing the sheets, going to the meetings, cooking all night, and standing on their feet all day long? I know what you were doing is harder than I can ever imagine. I'm from here, remember? I know what it's like. The fact that my family can call you to come work some ridiculous party on the most important night of your life, it's wrong. You think I don't know what wrong is? You heard daddy in there, he's nothing but a, but a tired old bigot. That's all he'll ever be. You wanna hear about your father? Let me tell you about your father. What about him? I get a phone call one evening, three weeks ago Monday, a phone call from the county jail. It was Cleo. Cleo was arrested? Sheriff hauled him off with some of his buddies for disturbing the peace. They were doing nothing. They were standing in line trying to register to vote. Hauled them off to county. Made them crowd all into one cell like animals. Made them fan stand facing a wall till he fouled his britches. Oh, God. 
Geneva, I'm sorry. Sorry don't count. Two hundred dollars. That's what counts. I even had the money in the bank, but they wouldn't take my check. I didn't want my son to have to spend a night in jail. What if it kept him out of college? What if they beat him or worse? I didn't know what to do, so I called Mr. Stafford. Daddy? He sent one of the men from the farm over to pay it. Got Cleo out, he said he wouldn't do it twice, so don't bother asking. I tried to pay him back, take it out of my wages. He wouldn't take one red cent. He just didn't want to have to hire new help. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, but it's true. There's white folks in Selma that are just plain mean. I'm not saying otherwise, but your dad is no saint, Lord knows. But he ain't got that kind of meanness. I done seen both. And I know the difference. But we can't just sit here. We can't just sit here and let, let him, him what? Let him walk all over you. Nobody's walking over me. But you were there. You were at those meetings. Every night for 10 weeks. You heard Dr. King. Oh, I heard him. He said you have to be strong. I know what he said. And stand up for what's right. And he also said that you can't do this work with anger in your heart. I should get going. Yes, you should. Ruth, I'm... You need to go, Clay. I'm sorry, Ruth. I really am. I, I didn't mean for all that to happen. Clay, I could strangle you sometimes. I wish you would sometimes. Don't tempt me. <laughs> Damon, I said I wasn't going to do this. Do what? Let you in? I could have could have crushed him, Ruth. I could have crushed him with my bare hands. But you didn't. But I could have. But you didn't. You get this picture in your mind that you're one kind of person. The kind who does right. And you go along living that and believing that. So one day you wake up and you you find you're not who you thought you were. You become the very thing you despised. Human? It's like I'm out in the woods and it's dark and I don't know where to step without falling. Like going on a bear hunt. Go again? You know, go on the way to like Granny used to do. You're out there and come up on something, a dark wood or a swamp. Stinking swamp. Oh, that's good, stinking swamp. You can't go over it. Can't go under it. You can't go around it. Gotta can't go, go through. through it. We just gotta go through it.
it, uh, through, uh, through a different connection. And, um, and we got to spend some time in Atlanta uh, and when he has visits here to see family. And uh, so it's a real honor to share this stage. So, thank you. Come on up. I'm not going to take much of your time uh, because I think you'll have questions maybe to ask uh, uh, Ms. Baldwin about her writing of the play. Uh, it is true, I, I read her play about a year ago and I said this play really belongs in New York City and any other place. That it, so anything that we can do I think to move the play in that direction uh, would be a, a big plus. And uh, some of you may have ideas on that. One of the stories in uh, my book called The Selma uh, involves the fact that uh, about two and a half days out on the march, when we're in Lowndes County, which is, uh, uh, there were 300 of us at that point, and the, the trees were draped with Spanish moss, and we were afraid of snipers lurking in those trees. It would have been very easy. So we had managed to get the uh, federalized state troopers to turn and face away from us. The first day out, they were facing toward us while we marched as though we were the problem. And uh, we brought it to their attention that none of us were in fact armed uh, and uh, got them to face the other way. But it, it was a, a hairy situation and we were down to uh, walking on a two-lane highway, and that meant we were on one lane going toward uh, Montgomery, and the cars coming in the other direction had to alternate which direction they went, because there's only one lane. It's like coming to a narrow bridge, and somebody's got to decide who's going to go across that bridge first. And uh, coming toward us, we spotted a brilliant red convertible car. Uh, I'm not talking dull red, I'm talking Chinese red, convertible, four beautiful blonde women in it, and the plate on the front of the car was a Mississippi plate. And they were singing, and what do you suppose they were singing? We shall overcome, what else? Um, that story represents a lot of stories in my book. Uh, showing that the population in Selma, and in the whole South for that matter, was being torn by what happened. Uh, it's, it's so easy for us to assume that uh, we in the North, you know, have the answer and the people in the South didn't have the answer. And in fact, um, life is much more complicated than that. I think uh, Mark used that word uh, complexity. Um, my daughter has written a book that got the Lincoln Prize uh, as the best book written about the Civil War period. She wrote, it, it came out about three years ago. And I learned something about the Civil War that never had dawned on me, even though I thought I knew something about it. And that was that uh, as forces built on North and South, uh, every single family in this country was torn north and south. Her book is about a guy named Joseph Holt, and uh, the subtitle to the book is uh, Lincoln's Forgotten Ally. Joseph Holt lived in Kentucky. Uh, he owned slaves, but as the war approached, he decided that he was on the side of the North. He wanted Lincoln to prevail. So almost single-handedly, he went around the state of Kentucky speaking and telling people that we've got to stay in the Union. He let his slaves go. Did I say that? Uh, but he, he was practically single-handed, kept Kentucky in the Union. Had Kentucky gone to the South, uh, Washington would have been untenable as a capital 
uh, uh, for Lincoln's government. They would have moved to East Lansing or someplace where they, they you know, were, would have been much less effective. Um, and um, uh, Joseph Holt's whole family were Confederate supporters. His brother died in a battle a as a Confederate. The only person in his family who stood with him was a great aunt who lived out west someplace, and they exchanged letters, and she said, you just be true to your ideals, uh, and uh, don't worry about the family. Now, I think this play has really caught exactly the tensions that have to have been true north and south at the time of Selma. Um, you have the black servant who has much at stake at keeping things the way they are. And you have the white liberal minister who's gone off and been influenced and he comes back and he's got his family to contend with. And they've got each other to contend with. The, you know, uh, it's, it's a situation that I think is repeated over and over and over again in our families. Is, is there anybody here who comes from a family who doesn't have somebody who disagrees with them from time to time? Because <laughs> I'd love to see your hand and I'd like to talk with you later. Uh, they would be very young. <laughs> very young, right. Or very old. <laughs> well, that's my take on this play, is that it really shows, uh, uh, there's just example after example that come to my mind from the 18 days I was down there, but when we, uh, a group of us ministers, black and white, uh, show up at an Episcopal church on a Sunday morning to worship, uh, some of the people take the point of view, this is just a publicity stunt. Uh, but one woman says, I am so ashamed of my clergy of uh, my, um, whatever it was, their board vestry, yeah, uh, that I really don't want to be a part of them anymore. Now, I don't know whether she stayed with them or not, but again, there were plenty of people in Alabama and Mississippi and elsewhere who um, I, I think supported us. I expect some of those people will be walking across the bridge uh, on Sunday. Uh, they came close to doing it, but they just couldn't do it uh, 50 years ago. And they actually did it last week in Selma. There was a beautiful march there, a, a, a unity march of, um, of community members in Selma, and, and I love the symbology of it where um, um, they, they marched from the outside, marching back into Selma. Yeah. And, uh, and it was really a, a special event. We went down, we're actually, after working on this play for 10 years, uh, we're bringing a reading of it to Selma at the end of the month. Um, and so I was there to check out the space where we were doing it. A wonderful organization called Arts Revive is producing it. Uh, and we get to uh, perform the reading um, amidst a, a um, showing of Spider Martin photographs. Um, so that's going to be really special. Uh, and we found out that this march was happening and uh, we're, we're leaving Selma in the morning. I said, like, well, let's just stay. And, uh, and ended up staying and seeing a bunch of people there and looked over and there was James Martin, who's the son of Matilda Martin, who was um, one of the main influences of inspiration for the play. And he was there with his son and his grandkids and uh, my husband and I ended up walking with him and holding hands and my cousin Olivia, who's here, and we walked back over the, the bridge together. So, um, so, and I also know the St. Paul's, the church where yep. um, they, they were- The Episcopal um, the church. The Episcopal church, that they're doing a unity service on the 29th yeah. um, with a, a black church, I think, from Montgomery. Uh, St. Mark's, Mark's from Birmingham. Oh, wonderful. So it's... Um, so they've uh, come a ways. Yeah, so they've come a ways. And I think that is, um, you know, th this play to me is a, is a family play. Um, and there are politics that are there, and there are politics in every family. But, um, but it's, a change is is slow and hard and it's wrought through relationships, um, I think more than ideas, uh, and that's something that we try to capture. You have done it. Uh, I, I'd love to hear any comments from out here Certainly. about the play. Or, or, or thoughts that it raised, anything? 
We have a few mics here. If somebody here, here. Would like. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Thank you. I'm um, George McLean. I'm a Methodist clergyman. Uh, allowed into this Augusta body. <laughs> I'm so glad to be in your presence. I love your book because it's helped make sense of my time here in those days. But I was um, in tears uh, during the, the, your readings because uh, it brought forward for me uh, a lot of feelings that I've been kind of buried uh, about the, um, the conflicts and the tensions that existed. Um, when I was, uh, I was in Birmingham in 63 for the summer working with the Alabama Council on Human Relations, and uh, one of the things that they asked me to do was talk to some of the local clergy, white clergy. I was living with the black clergymen. Uh, and uh, a couple of those were among those to whom Dr. King had written the letter from a Birmingham jail. You know, and they were progressives in their own context. And they were hurt by that. You know, and I could understand that. And also being Methodist, you know, what, a quarter of Alabama is Methodist, and, and most of them were arrayed against the movement for a variety of reasons. And uh, those who chose to act on other values had to leave. Um, I've heard the number like 40 from uh, Mississippi uh, had to leave their ministry, uh, and I don't know how many in Alabama. Um, and I think of the daughter of a, um, a Methodist clergyman from South Alabama who was at Huntington College in Montgomery uh, during the triumphal entry on the 25th, you know, from Selma to Montgomery. She was with the movement, and the college locked her in a room mm -hmm. along with some others to keep from marching. Mm -hmm. All of this, you know, has you got me in touch with what's what the, torn me apart of th in all of this. Thank you, thank, thank you so much. You. I think you're oh, My name is Susan Hill. Susan Hill, come on here. Right, I think here's oh, my right here. My name is Susan Hill. I grew up in a small town in North Carolina and my family had a black woman who worked for my mother for 57 years. So those relationships are long and complicated and I, I could really resonate with that. And, I, and my little town didn't integrate its schools until after I was gone, but they did it peacefully. And Odie's grandchildren were a part of the first group that integrated the schools. And I know that my father was racist, and yet he was influenced by those relationships and by my mother to make that happen peacefully. And I, it, I thank you for your play. It really can demonstrates a, a level of complexity and that isn't always apparent. Chris Hager from River Road Unitarian University Congregation in Bethesda, Maryland. I have one question for you, and then I have a comment for you. My question for you is, we hear about the walk across the bridge. We don't hear much about that 50-mile march from Montgomery to Selma, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. And for you, have you considered working with different congregations to bring the play to us? And certainly the, no, thank you. You can think about your answer while I uh, okay. feel the first question. Um, this is one of the shortcomings of the movie. Uh, and uh, I've written to the New York Times about it, apart from the fact that James Reeb is identified as a priest from Boston. Uh, every, every Unitarian in the audience should stand up and, and yell at that point. But, um, <laughs> I, I've seen the movie four times now because uh, people keep coming that want to see it, and I want to see it with them, 
and each time I've seen it, I've enjoyed it more. But it, it does have some shortcomings, and one is you don't get any sense at all of what uh, the movement felt like to the people who came down there and, and marched uh, or stood for, think about it, 240 consecutive hours nose to nose with the police, mm -hmm. with deputies behind them threatening, pointing their billy club at you and saying, you know, when all hell breaks loose, I'm coming after you. Uh, there was not a moment where uh, there wasn't a lot of fear, I suppose until the uh, judgment came down that 300 would be able to go the full distance. Then p people kind of relaxed because obviously this was going to happen. But um, what I remember as somebody who was out there uh, all many, many of those hours uh, was the rain. It didn't stop raining. Mm. And Don Harrington said when you go down there, uh, when it rains in Alabama, it really rains. <laughs> now, I'm learning when it snows in Alabama, it also <laughs> snows. Uh, but I wasn't worried about snow. Uh, it, it, uh, there's not a drop of rain in there. And there's also the impression given by the movie that when the court order gives them the right to march, 10,000 people pour out of Selma and march to Montgomery. Of course, that didn't happen. And there was a very interesting process by which the 300 were picked who would march days two, three, and four. Day one, everybody could march. So yes, they all did pour across the bridge as it looks. But then a committee decides which 300 are entitled to walk the rest of the distance. And the only reason I was one of the 300 was because James Reeb had been killed. And I made the point, you've got to have somebody representing James Reeb. Now it turned out that a marshal was in fact a unitary. And they said, well, we thought that would sort of suffice. And I said, well, I, I came down here from New York thinking I'm going to march. And I'm intent enough on it that when the 300 of you start off tomorrow, I'm gonna to be just a few yards behind. And they, the committee got their heads together and they said, uh, we got a fanatic here. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it's better probably to include him in the 300 than uh, let him come behind and get uh, picked off. So uh, I, I sort of forced my way, but uh, again, I have to recognize that it could have been any of our Unitarian ministers. In fact, uh, um, I was at an event the other night uh, celebrating Selma, and uh, I said that uh, except for the fact that I didn't go to the restaurant that night, I could just as easily have been the last person out and the one who was attacked. Uh, I, I think we're all sort of interchangeable parts with each other. And sometimes the finger points at us and says, now it's your turn. Uh, and I, this is my message to young people. You just don't know what's ahead. And someday there's gonna be a situation and people are gonna to say to you, what do we do now? And uh, it's very good to have an answer. <laughs> okay. okay Somebody you. over here. Uh, oh, the, yes. uh, the play. So, so I have had, uh, I've done some talks with, uh, um, I've got my, oh, yeah. okay. my little fancy thing on. Um, I've done some talks with uh, uh, community groups and religious groups. We've also, um, through Kennesaw State University where I teach in the Department of Theater and Performance Studies, uh, we've started some partnerships and I actually got to um, go with a group uh, last spring and do a reading of it in Germany. Uh, at a university there, and I do, it's something I'd really love to do because I think it is, it does give a window, a sort of human side to the story, um, but um, I'm certainly happy to, um, to talk to anybody. It, it's, um, it's, it's great, and I would love to have it um, go out more. I also teach full time. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm learning I'm much more human than I used to be. So um, no, I'm very, very, uh, very good. interested in getting, getting the play out. So thank you. Um, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Carol Houston. I live in New York City. I wish I could say I have wonderful connections to theaters there that could help you. I, I can't say that. 
But what I did want to say is I think there would be interest in this uh, I th outside of UU circles. I don't think you have to really consider it just that. I think there is an interest in it. Dick knows that there was a play called Selma 65 yeah. produced at La Mama last, last fall. Not a rousing success, and I was only moderately impressed with it. But, but there, there is interest. There's another play that was at the top of Ben Brantley's list of, of plays for the year called Appropriate by a young black playwright named Brandon Jacobs Jenkins. And it is about family dysfunction arising from the family going back to the South and discovering the racism at the heart of the family. So, so these, prob these problems, these family problems arising, I think, I think there's a public for it. So Thank you. go for it. <laughs> Thanks, Carol. Uh, my name is Craig Sear uh, from Edmonds, Washington, the Unitarian Universalist uh, ch Church there. Thank you so much for bringing these couple scenes. It really has whetted my appetite to see, their, to see the, uh, the rest of it. You know, I think probably the GA 2015 schedule is cooked already, <laughs> but it sure strikes me that we could really benefit from seeing this play at a GA. And, um, so. There's a lot of theaters in Portland, Oregon, I'm sure. Oh, so. yes, I love Portland. I'll go there. <laughs> we'll go there, won't we? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Reverend Annie Pierpoint Mertz. I'm an Episcopal priest um, from uh, St. Paul's Church in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, I wanted to share a line that really struck me that Clayton said, which was, I tried to keep things separate. Um, mm -hmm. And that hit me as, as a young clergywoman, but also just as an individual who is working through these issues in herself that we want to keep these things separate. We want to separate our feelings of fear and our feelings of um, courageousness. And I, I just really appreciated the, the illumination of that. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. I'm Ken Silberman Bunn from the Wellsprings Congregation in Exton, Pennsylvania. First of all, thank you for your reflections and for the performance. It was fabulous. Is your play available to the public that we could read the entire thing if we can't see it? Um, if you email me, I'm happy to share it with you. Okay. It's, not, it's not published at this point, but it's I'm not. looking to do that. But yes, I'm happy to share it. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Put them in touch with me. <laughs> um, we'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I do want to talk to you about um, an opportunity we might have in Boston for you. Great. Um, my name is Bruce Field. I'm from Murray Unitarian Universalist Church in Attleboro, Massachusetts, uh, south of Boston. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just give a quick question to each three of you. And, and thank you, Dick, for coming and, and talking and telling us more about that as well. <laughs> um, so, Margaret, I'm, I'm curious ab about if there's something that you felt you had to take out of the play. Um, you know, you said it, did, it couldn't fit, you know, there's too much time, or that just didn't fit in with her. And I'm wondering for the two of you if there's something about uh, your character, either about the person yourself, or that, that person themselves, or something that they said or felt that really affected you. Um, well, there's a lot that I had to leave out of the play. <laughs> um, and some of it was uh, originally when I, I had the idea for the play, I wanted to have the first act. Uh, in 1965 and the second act in 1985 or 1990 and I realized very quickly I was not going to get out of 65 for a while so <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I also feel like there's something about that um, that experience of learning that the story the myth um, wasn't true um, and again that it's not a um, I don't think it was a malicious lie. I don't think it was even an intentional lie. I think it was the way stories evolve over time. But there's something about that experience that I want to capture. And so I'd, I'd love to write a trilogy of these plays that are tracing the two families um, through time. Uh, so I'm, um, uh, there's a lot more to say. I think, you know, writing a family play, it's, it's always, it's hard to write plays. They're just hard to write. But, um, but writing family plays is really hard. Uh, and I was really fortunate to have um, my family come, my extended family uh, come, and, and Matilda's family come and see the play and respond to the play uh, and give me feedback. Um, 
sometimes more than I wanted. Uh, but, uh, but, but that, you know, it's, it's, I think ultimately it's been a really positive thing in our family. And, uh, and um, so, yes, you always leave things out. But, but somehow in the giving myself permission, once I thought, found out the real story wasn't true, gave me permission, I think, to, to ultimately tell a truer story through the fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, well, to answer your question, <laughs> I guess the, the line that Clayton and I have when I say to him, you can leave, you can get away from all of this, I don't have that option, um, it kind of hit home with me. <clears throat> I didn't grow up in this era but my mother and my grandmother did. And my mother would tell me that she remembers the whites only and the blacks only signs coming down. So it, it hit home, that one particular line. But more importantly, I guess, um, it just helped me to understand that although I wasn't there to witness the acts of violence and the racism, this play just spoke to me on a level that was just so powerful. So it read, that line resonated with me more so than any of the others. And it's such a pleasure to be here with you I knew that I was going to cry. I just knew it. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> All right, I'm better. But it's such a pleasure to be here and, and to, to put a, a name with a face. Mm -hmm. you, you, you read about the things that happened. You see it on television. And, the, you know, Jim Clark, the sheriff of Dallas County at the time, you know, I saw eyes on the prize. Um, is that the correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I saw yeah. that. And to see George Wallace, all of these people that are named in this play, and you, you see them and you hear them speak and you, you get a feel for who they were and, and how they felt about segregation. And it was deeply rooted. It was frightening. And I'm grateful that I wasn't a part of that era, but I'm also grateful that the people who fought for change, they did it so that I wouldn't have to experience that. And I'm grateful. So that's what resonated with me the most, that, you know, he had, he had options that simply were not available to me at that time. Um, obviously, uh, my experiences uh, come from a come from a different place, um, but but I mirror everything that you just had to say about this play. I mean, it's it's lovely. That's the lovely thing about theater is to have um, to have our lives reflected back to us. It helps us learn more about ourselves. It helps us mer learn more about each other, um, and uh, and and taking that journey through this history um, was really exciting for me. And then on top of that, there, I think there's something really, really universal about, regardless of, of who you are, something really universal about uh, the challenge of finally standing up to your parents. I mean, it's either, it's either your mom or your dad. It's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Um, but, but, to, but to, and you know, and that's the thing, that's the line. I, I wanted to keep these things separate. I've, I've got a life where I'm myself, but then when I come back here, I'm a little eight-year-old boy, and, um, and, and I'm manipulated and controlled, and there's, there's a moment in everyone's life where you, you break free from that somehow, and so, sometimes it's violent, and sometimes it's not. Luckily for me, in my real life, it kind of just sort of naturally evolved, but, but to connect to that and um, you know, dig that stuff back up was, was mm -hmm. also exciting for me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, my 
My name is Mary Kay Boyd, and I'm with the St. Paul Contingency. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much. Um, I was reminded that I am a descendant of parents and grandparents who were part of the Great Migration. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother told me the story of trying to get out of Mississippi, where she did not want her son to live the kind of life that she and my grandfather had lived as sharecroppers. She was the nanny for the landowner's children. My grandfather had to sneak off in the night to Omaha. She was to follow. The landowner would not let her go because he said she owed money to the company store. But she knew how to keep receipts and the numbers. And her response was, you will let me go or I will kill myself and my son, and you won't have a nanny for your children. That's the strength that I come from. Mm. But I also wanted to ask you if you are familiar with Mixed Blood Theater in Minneapolis? Yes. And yes. Jack Ruler? Yes. This fits with their mission. Oh, great. Have yes. you done anything there? I have not, but I admire their work greatly. So if there's any way I can help with that connection, I'd be more that. than happy to. I don't, I don't believe I have a question, but I wanted to say thank you for being here, and I wanted to say thank you for sharing your story, sharing the play, and making it a reality that we can see. I stand here um, with a lot of emotions, and having this shared experience with everyone here. Um, my name is Pastor Maria Perry. I did forget that I am part of um, a combined relationship that has been built around interfaith um, with the Unity Universalist of St. Paul. And um, we are above every name ministry. The work that we've done together, building relationships to break down barriers that have impacted our lives in such a way that is hidden beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. And today we can stand here together and say that we are willing to do the work that we are willing to do the work to bring in the solidarity, solidarity and the equality that we need to break these things that stop us from building. And it has been amazing, amazing, amazing. And I wanna thank the UUA for allowing us, there's 70 people that came here with us and we've built so many relationships, but to give thanks and gratitude for all of this work and knowing that we can build because I had no idea how the Unity, Unity, Unity Unitarians were so involved in the civil rights movement. And today, I see that there was more than one person that stood up for the rights of our people, of everybody. And that is amazing, amazing. And it drives me to want to do more work. It drives me to stand here just to say again, I thank you. I love you. I hold your heart. I embrace every love and every fear that you have inside of you today. And we just welcome you. So I thank you on the behalf of my congregation, on the behalf of the 70 people that drove here to witness the separation that has taken place that we want to bring together. I say thank you. Mm. It's so cool. No, it's not a question. Um, I also wanted to thank you. I'm not sure I can be as heartfelt, but um, I do want to share my thanks for all of you and for the Margaret and the presenters um, for not only sharing today but and coming to this conference, but also just for doing the work. Um, and I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I'm Margaret's cousin, and I'm Fontaine. This is my sister Olivia, and the character of Ruth in the play is my mother. <laughs> and, uh, so that's why I needed to tell Margaret and tell you all that um, I really wanted to thank Margaret for her bravery in broaching this because um, it's it's very complex. Um, 
And in fact, uh, I've just this month discovered another misperceived family story when I accompanied my mother over to um, the Montgomery Archives to listen to a talk about uh, Jonathan Daniels, who was an Episcopal martyr of the civil rights movement who had died also in relationship to the whole events of, of this time in Selma. And in that lecture, I learned that my home church, the Episcopal Church, um, which I had always thought we've always been integrated and I've always felt very superior about that, um, I discovered that, that, that my home church refused communion to some folks. Uh, com contrary to all the stories I had heard <laughs> growing up. So uh, another, perhaps for the second version, second, <laughs> second act. But um, just to sh tell you uh, how complex this family story is and how brave uh, Margaret has been, um, my mom, I really do admire her, but she's kind of one of those women that can go bear hunting with a switch. As my <laughs> That was a saying of my grandfather that... Uh, the guy who was dying in the play, but anyway, she's she's tough. But at the same, and 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 she's sincere. You know, she goes over to the archives. She's a member of one Selma, a, a biracial group that works on things. But at the same time, uh, in at Obama's first um, election, she t she told me over the phone. She said, "I think your daddy and I are the only people in Selma who voted for Obama." <laughs> I said, "Mama." I think about 85% of Dallas County voted for Obama. <laughs> Thank you. And I just want to, Tane and I both work for the Birmingham Public Library, which is up the street, and they have the best uh, archives of the Civil Rights Movement. So if you have a moment and you'd like to see the, do the jail docket that Martin Luther King signed, or the, the fragments from the Bethel Baptist Church, or any of the other great asso things associated with the Civil Rights March, please come. And I'm asking um, the local um, press to bring you a whole stack of these letters, which uh, Margaret used for the play. All right. Can we have another round of applause, please? Thank you.